we're recording now. So, Mr. John, welcome to the podcast. All right. <laughs> Thank you for agreeing to come on, man. Sure. I mean, I don't know what kind of bear trap awaits me, but we'll find out. <laughs> it's nothing too bad. Nothing too bad. Um, do you want to introduce yourself for the audience? Yeah. So um, I'm John Levengood. Uh, I have uh, three degrees in entomology from two different SEC schools, uh, obviously in the U.S. Uh, I, I'm an entomologist. I have the luxury of actually working in my field with what I studied as my job title. I'm an insect taxonomist over for the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, we have entomologists, we don't all inspect meat. Uh, and truth be told, I don't even know much about agriculture. I was hired for my expertise in natural history and general insect biology and insect taxonomy uh, more specifically. So I'm an insect taxonomist. I'm that kind of national geographic uh, kind of entomologist. And uh, I've been doing this for 20 years, ever since I accidentally stumbled into the major while I was uh, an accounting major at UF uh, back in 2000. And it took me a couple of years to switch over and uh, occasionally disenfranchised with the state of science funding in the world. Uh, but um, otherwise, I, I get to say I love my job. So hold on. How, how do you accidentally become an entomologist? So, yeah, it, it, <laughs> right. It sounds like I'm trying to give you like, you know, the fun, like colloquialism that someone would say at like a Christmas party to like their spouse's coworker. <laughs> but no. So my very first semester at UF, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's a it's a real cluster uh, when it's your first semester. Everyone has to do all their beginning core classes for their majors. Right. UF is huge. There's there's 10,000 freshmen uh, the year that I started uh, in 2000. And uh, that's typical for UF, by the way. I know about, about 40,000 undergrads, 10,000 or so grad students. Yeah, it's a big school. Yeah, all on that campus, essentially, at the time, because there was almost no distance ed in 2000. <clears throat> so, I was just scrambling to find things to fill my gen ed requirements. They gave us some advice on what not to take because it would fill no requirements. And for biology, uh, I just couldn't, there were just so many options. Uh, and I saw something called the insects and it was kind of like a bugs for jock selective, like a 1000 or 100, if you will, like a 101 level elective. Yep. And I took that and there's, you know, four, four, 400 people in a auditorium, but I was always kind of that, that, you know, um, jackass of a student who, when he knew something, he wanted the world to know it. So, and, and I, <laughs> I, and I guess, you know, this is one of those things where sometimes you, you, you think you want to do something and you work hard and you love doing it because you worked hard to get there and you're satisfied by your hard work. And sometimes people will want to become an architect for that reason because their dad's an architect and they work towards it and then they're gratified because they love it. And other people want to become an architect because they are enamored with the grandeur of spandrels coming off of a Gothic cathedral, right? And they want to right. learn more about it. So there are two different ways that we can converge and really find arguably the same love on a long enough timeline in a field. And so I, I was someone where when it came to these entomology classes, even though it's just like sitting there and listening to stuff in, in a class, these were a lot of fun facts. These were a lot of connecting the world in a personable way to insects for non-science majors. A lot of fun so basically facts. just the introduction of, hey, what are these and how do they play a role in your everyday life? Even more basic. It, okay. It's almost like the class was a list of fun facts. You're being tested. Every, every test question is a fun fact. Gotcha. Um, what kind of insects did they find in King Tut's tomb? Hide beetles. <laughs> but this thing has been sealed for X amount of time. So these things have been surviving on the skin cells and the fabric and the death of their past generations and whatever other animals that were in there living for a few generations and those rat cadavers etc. And all the servants cadavers, right, that get, that get interred with Pharaoh, or interred isn't really the word, but there's all this stuff in there that's organic. And if you were the five to 500, you know, two millimeter insects that got in there before it was relatively perfectly sealed, with, with, just by, by sheer mass, right, um, weighing down on all these cracks and crevices, you have a, a lot of biomatter to survive on. And then even though you could tell yourself it's finite, these insects are creating 
dust and cadavers that will then be fed upon. And these things don't have high uh, metabolic rates and they don't have homeostasis. So their energy requirements and oxygen requirements are very low. So, you know, uh, 5,000 generations of hide beetles later, when we opened up King's tomb, King Tut's tomb, and I don't remember the class, it was like, I don't know, 1908 or something. I'm making up a year. So if there are any archaeologists listening, screaming that I'm an idiot, I'm just making up a number <laughs> that was probably about a hundred years ago, they found live hide beetles in there. Now that what I just told you is what the lecturer would have spent the equivalent three minutes telling the class with a couple fun slides, right? Right. Well, but the test question is simply going to be what was found in King Tut's tomb? A, live rats. B, live hide beetles. C, live scarab beetles, because scarab beetles are going to be discussed when we're talking about Egyptians, but there were no live scarab beetles, contrary to the mummy movie. And, and <laughs> but either way, you, you, if you if you find this stuff interesting, it's like you're coordinated and you can just pick up a bat and you can swing and you can hit the ball. Right. And other people need to work to hit that ball. And my intro to accounting course was like pulling teeth in terms of tedium. And I had to pay attention and study a little bit to, you know, get a B plus. And I didn't show up all the time because I really didn't care about it. And I'd rather get a few extra hours washing dishes at the restaurant where I worked, you know, my freshman year sometimes. So yeah, accounting is not fun. It wasn't, no. And principles of intro to the principles of business management and <laughs> just whatever inane things, some kind of economics class. I don't even remember the name that you would take after you took macro and microeconomics because I had that from like AP credit or something. So, but all these classes I'm taking from my major are things that I have to pay attention to in, in a way that it's not interesting to me. I really, I need to take notes. I need to study. This other class, it's like watching a cool nature show or watching a movie that you liked. Afterwards, you can talk about it. Right. If you get roped into watching a movie that bores you to tears, your attention just isn't there. You're not, you don't soak it up as much. And so, again, entomology, for whatever reason, uh, whatever geekery that was lying latent inside me, uh, I could pick up the bat and I could swing. Right? I suppose I could pick up the butterfly net and I could swing. Um, not that I like <laughs> butterflies, uh, but um, I actually yeah, met so, a lot of people that don't like butterflies, which I find very strange. Well, you know, I guess it, you mean entomologists, or is that what well, we're just about, people or? in general? The people don't want butterflies around them, and in my head, I think of butterflies as a beautiful little sensitive thing. You know, I think you know a lot of people react to things uh, by their movement, and if a butterfly is startled by you when you're close to it its movement pattern is probably going to be akin to a spazzing out crack addict, <laughs> even though it's a beautifully uh, wardrobed one. Right. And that movement frazzles people. Uh, and when people aren't really kind of attuned to other organisms, if you will, I think they're more startled by that movement. It's like, you know, there are so many people who are just so, they seem to just be good with animals. They don't know yeah. what they're doing. It's that they're calm. Right. And that they're, it's not that they're choosing not to make sudden movements. It's that they're calm and the animals are often going to react to your nervousness. And if you nervously twitch when an animal makes you nervous, you're going to make the animal nervous. And so I think it's just that twitch. But butterflies, most people are pretty kind to butterflies. I don't yep. like them from a study perspective because they are um, mostly anyway, especially in the boundaries of the United States. They're easy. Um, you can identify a butterfly in front of you on a flower uh, to species if you have a handbook readily available and it doesn't go anywhere and you're patient. Uh, the things I study tend to be a couple millimeters long, little brown or black, generally nondescript things where you could have 25 species in front of you and you don't know if it's one or 25 species. They all look the same until you dissect their genitalia or count their antennal segments on a two millimeter beetle, mind you, you know, count their internal <laughs> segments or, or look at the, some nuance of their, of their claws or some little spot, count the spines on their tibia on their hind leg out of their six legs, again, on a two millimeter beetle. So it's not as, ex it's not thrilling to me in the science perspective. There is not much lying in wait uh, in the realm of discovery. Indiana gotcha. Jones is exciting because of the discovery when he picks out that grail in the last crusade, if anyone here knows that like 19, I don't know, 89 or 92 movie, when he picks that grail, go watch that movie, by the way, it's an awesome movie, uh, Steven Spielberg. But um, 
when he picks that grill, you realize based on the way this whole movie is going that ever since it went there like 2000 years ago, no one has ever known that that was the Holy Grail reference, you know, theologically. Right. So it's this thrill of discovery. These butterflies are old hat. They're easy to identify. Whereas I could have a beetle that we know a lot about, but you still need to get it home to a microscope and be talented in that group of beetles and have the literature available and be kind of fluent in that literature just to be able to establish, oh yeah, this is a really common thing that's all over the place. Right. You know, so, so it's, it, it, it's not, hey, required. I can go buy a book, take a picture of it and then look it up on Google, right? Right, right. Yeah, like identifying the butterfly is kissing a boo-boo on your kid's knee when they skin their knee. Identifying the beetles I deal with is like, I don't know, replacing an ex-athlete's knee in orthopedic surgery or something. Yeah, a little bit more complicated. <laughs> right. And even then, it, it, at some point, it just becomes, you know, going, you know, color by numbers, you're just going through the required steps to get there, but it's it, it still requires work. Was it easy to say, hey, you know what, I'm picking up this stuff a lot easier because I'm interested into it, uh, interested in it. And did you ever think about, hey, who studies this stuff, right? Like, is there even a career in this? Because I mean, accounting and finance, it's all boring, right? But there are well, jobs. Well, until you see the paycheck and, or their boats. Right, exactly. Not, there. You, you have a lot of entomologists with boats unless it's 17 feet long and has a single little uh, motorboat engine on it. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, for me, I, I, I got lucky. You know, I went to school. I wanted to do marketing because I'm very visual. I'm very, you know, hey, if we can pull this lever, we can do whatever. And then I took an econ class and econ was kind of the, the bug class to you, you know everything came natural. I didn't have to study it. I just went out and aced the test, right? Now, finance, accounting, all that stuff. Yeah, I had to study because that was boring. Um, but I knew that at least with econ, there was decent money, jobs, opportunity, et cetera. When you decided to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to study insects. What was going through your mind? Were, were you nervous? Were you kind of doubting? Or were you like, you know what? I like it. I'm just going to do it no matter what. So, you know, we're, we're talking about 18-year-old John. It's tough to put myself <laughs> in his head. <laughs> You know, it's like, I mean, 25-year-old John thought that 18-year-old John was a moron. 29-year-old John thought 25-year-old John was a moron. And today, 40-year-old <laughs> John thinks 35-year-old John didn't know shit. Uh, so about the world, you know, right, about, right. about my own self-awareness even, and all the things that I thought that I knew, you know, yep. and uh, it, no matter how much more humble or self-aware you get, you, you still find ways to look back at yourself and call yourself a jackass five years ago. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to swear on this podcast. You can I'm trying to say whatever you I'm want. I'm trying man. to stay in the PG-13 zone. If there's one accidental left bomb, we, we're not quite at an R rating. So Look, this is this is America. So you okay. can do whatever you want. Right. Sure. Okay. It's a, right. Let's just let's just in, initiate the purge then. <laughs> yeah. uh, so no. So 18 year old John knew that. Uh, well, so I, I kind of had a plan and my plan was uh a relative of mine's path and he was very successful. And so my plan was master's in accounting, law school, LLM and tax law, a 10 year gruelingly boring education. And then it's the kind of thing where you really need to royally, let's get our, uh, let's just borderline our RPG 13 rating here. You got to royally fuck up if you have that education and not make a quarter of a million dollars uh, within five to eight years of mm. graduation. Uh, graduation where I would have finished all that schooling at about, I don't know, 2009. Um, you would have had to really mess up. So by now, I, I mean, a quarter million dollars, I mean, I would have had to screw up or decide I didn't like the pressure of the higher jobs. Right. Half a million dollars would be very reasonable without even being top of your game. You know, just a good team player, uh, with a good pedigree, making the right relationships along the way. Not being an idiot, right? Re really, just, it's not being the best. It's just just doing enough. Um, uh, doing enough and caring about the result. Right, right. right. Um, so in my head, I had picked something that would be very lucrative. And I knew that m most people in my family would have just been thrilled with that. And uh, my father is a neuro-oncologist, uh, by the way. And so when I suggested, hey, you know, after, and it took me a year of electives uh, to even start thinking about this hard. Uh, and then I TA'd a class and then I took a couple classes for majors that, that were upper division when I was a sophomore. 
Uh, they asked me to TA a class that has grad students in it. It's a mix of grad and undergrad, but I just love this stuff so much. And it's one of those things where it doesn't matter all the rest of your education. It just matters what classes you took and what you learned about bugs, right? right. So it's, it's almost like speaking Spanish or something. Age is not a factor. So I just, I started thinking to myself, I was worried because I, I mean, I didn't think that professors in entomology made much and compared to what I was looking at doing, they didn't. There are some, there are some very well-paid ones, but it, it's not, it's not common, especially not for the level of education, uh, you know, but to, because typically you do a bachelor's degree, you do a master's degree, uh, you do a PhD uh, typically. Um, and then your PhD in biological sciences, if you look this up, the average PhD in biological sciences is about five years in psychology, it might only be three or four years. Biology is longer just because of the nature of what you're studying. Uh, there are more, uh, there are more footfalls. There, are, there are there are more snags that you can come across. So it slows you down, and there's there's more humility, I believe, in the process. I think, in just my opinion, than a lot of fields. So, and then you're underpaid at the end of the day. You know, to do something <laughs> that hopefully you, and the more the, the lower you get paid, the more likely you are to uh, to love your job. I know people who work for the state agriculture; they make fifty or sixty grand a year to run agriculture entomology for our whole state of Florida. I started getting paid more than that with the USDA, but I don't like my job as much as he does. Right. Uh, yeah. But it's it, a weird correlation usually. Yeah. Yeah. And then professors, okay. They'll get paid what I do or a little more, but for your first seven or eight years, you're going to, you're going to run 70, 80 hours working your way towards tenure. So you're really exactly. working and you might love it, but it doesn't make it not exhausting. Yep. It makes it hard to start a family. Uh, a lot, just go on vacations. It's tough. So again, there, it's, it's, you know, there's this complicated web of, of all our decision-making. So I, I just knew you didn't get paid as much for your time investment in the education. And my dad just said to me, look, I respect what you want to do. And if, if you do this and, you know, you go all the way with this, like you'll be taken care of. And he didn't mean like he was going to pay my rent or anything, but I'm also an only child of a doctor. And while he wasn't affluent or, you know, wealthy, he was, he was well off. Right. Um, so the, everything would have been fine if I struggled, I guess. But I don't know. The more I learned about entomology and the more I loved entomology as a field, the more disenfranchised I became with employment in the field. Uh, because over the course of uh, the early 2000s, every year, um, uh, NSF, the National Science Foundation, which is where most people who are doing natural history studies, taxonomic studies, ecological work, phylogenetics and insects, that's where you're getting your funding. Um, and the, uh, the total amount of money going to N NSF was not really increasing or it was increasing marginally, maybe equivalent to inflation. Uh, but really, don't forget, industry is going up more than inflation, right? The stock market is going up more than inflation. Oh, well, yeah, of course. So so that was very humbling. It was really like relative to the power of a dollar, the NSF was getting weaker every year. And on top of that, the proportional amount of want money that went into the um, divisions of NSF to which I in the future would be applying for grants was getting proportionately smaller on top of that. Uh, more things were going to the biomed, even though biomed also has other granting agencies, NIH, the National Institute of Health, that's a biggie. Um, that's something that agricultural entomologists can go into too. Um, but for me, it was a, a much narrower window when I'm looking at it that way. And so after my master's degree or after my bachelor's degree, I worked for a year thinking about things. I started a master's degree. I was working full time, so it took me longer than normal. Right. Like working three different part-time bug jobs. <laughs> so I was all, all in on the field, right? Right. But, um, but then at the end of my master's degree, and I, I just see what my friends or my, my, my peers are getting for jobs. And even though you might not know a lot of entomologists, it, it, how many entomologist positions do you think there are? All these pest control people coming to your house, they might not have ever even taken a class. Well, yeah, it's not like they're in, in the hell, the person who owns their business might have taken a class, not necessarily an entomologist. Yeah, right? because so, at that point, it's just a business. Right, right. It's 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 wheeling and dealing. It's like dentistry by virtue of teeth whitening for money uh, rather than teeth cleaning. And so mm -hmm. you and I'm not making fun of dentistry. I'm just, <laughs> just no, no. But that's a good example. Right. Because I remember, um, at the, at, you know, when I used to live around malls, you go in there and there would be a lady in the middle of a mall 
offering people to whiten their teeth. And right. I'm and thinking that, you're not a dentist, but I'm sure she's getting paid to kind of look like one. Yeah. So, I mean, a good friend of mine is a dentist. Uh, anyone listening in the Tampa area, South Tampa smiles. He has a lot of offices out here. Um, he, he, he'd call it a business. Of course, you're doing your teeth cleaning so that when something happens, like you need braces, you chip a tooth, mm -hmm. you want a teeth whitening, you, you, things like that. You're the person to whom they go. And that, and that's where the money is. You know, you, you clean their teeth for five years. So that every five years you get the thing that's several grand <laughs> and, okay. and, yep. and, and that's where your payday really is. Uh, whether or not you're talking them up for it or they could use whiter teeth, I don't know. But <laughs> so I, I just see what my, my, my peers are getting for work and so many of them. And I mean, with doctorates, they're teaching high school, um, teaching junior college, not a bad thing to do, but they're teaching it part time and they're teaching the classes they wouldn't want to teach. They are teaching and not to knock the people to whom they're teaching, but they are teaching intro to anatomy and physiology to nursing students. They are teaching maybe core biology, maybe, but probably biology for non-science majors. Right. Um, they are teaching other things that they happen to overlap with on a minor basis and across their degrees. They're teaching high school, like high school math, because you were a science major and you're hmm. good at math, I suppose. And you passed the, the requisite exam to be able to teach math. But at the end of the day, even though there aren't a lot of entomologists positions out there, there are, uh, if I applied for five different professorships out of my grad degree, I, I knew all, I knew half the people applying for all these jobs. And we know that we're all applying for all these jobs. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, it turns into a rat race and there really are too many assholes on the planet, even with entomology PhDs. It's not just how people like to joke, oh, there are more lawyers in law school today than there are lawyers already walking the planet. What are they going to do? We don't need all of them. Right. right. It, 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 guess what? Same thing with entomologists. I, I don't I'm not I don't know the numbers, but I know what these people are doing for a living. You know what I mean? A lot of them end up uh, gradually leaving uh, science, period, because the jobs that they're getting are just so <sighs> dissatisfyingly tangent to any of the science that they ever loved. Right. And but, you know, then there's the other reality check. You know, uh, we like to think. Oh gosh, well, John's dad is a neuro oncologist. He must really know his stuff. It's like, well, of all the neuro oncologists out there, um, the way you become a neuro oncologist is essentially by doing at least enough to not fail to become a neuro oncologist, right? <laughs> you could barely pass every exam in the history of medical school and pass medical school, but guess what? Malpractice insurance exists for a reason. Um, there are plenty, I'm sure everyone has met a lawyer they were dissatisfied with oh, whether or not you right? there are doctors out there who barely, my dad would tell me he barely passed medical school. He barely finished. Uh, but it wasn't until after that that he started to love it. He loved it during his residency. That's where he really developed his skill set. And of course, that's where you get your real skills. But that's right. where he started to give a damn. Most yep. people give a damn because they're dreaming of being a doctor. And that's the marathon they're running. And then after that, they just realize the, the other world on the other side of that finish line. For him, he's just doing it because his dad was a circuit judge in you know, uh, a Florida justice. So and that you know, makes sense, right? Like, like you were saying... It if you, you can go to a, an accounting class and fall asleep and barely pass, right? But maybe you do get a job at a, an accounting firm and then you realize that you love it, right? And then you become one of the best accountants because you're actually in it and you love it. Well, and realistically, most people, most people who are highly skilled in their field and who got hired for a job because they're highly skilled in their field, not just because they're liked, end up doing something multiple echelons below what they can do. Makes sense. It's just the way there's not much demand for these high tier things. And these high tier things come with all these liabilities and checks and balances, et cetera. So right. unless you go work for industry, right? Yep. Um, that's where the money is. But those, that, 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 that can be soul crushingly draining as well, uh, unless you just love the money or love the pressure. But, but at the end of the day, these graduate degrees, all graduate degrees, and, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to poo poo graduate degrees, uh, but they're union cards. You passed, you got a high school degree. No one's calling you an expert of anything. People shouldn't call you an expert of anything when you get a bachelor's degree. I don't think people should call you an expert of something when you get a master's and a PhD, because in the world of people with a master's and a PhD in your field, 
you might be the kid on the slow bus. <laughs> That's true. You, That's very you, true. And if you didn't love this, you could cram and get A's on all your tests. The people who crammed for their tests, ask them how to, how to solve uh, an integral function from calculus two, even a year after they got an A cramming for that test. They might not remember it by then or five years just to alter the analogy and make it more swallowable for someone. Uh, what do you remember of some of the classes you got A's in? Do you remember all the principles and, and theorems of, you know, whatever theoretical economics class you were taking? Do you oh, remember God, what no, I it, it's, it's, well, I mean, in part, it's part of the system, right? We, we, we all kind of have to just study for the test. And do I know a better way to do you know, school? No, but, you know, a vast majority of people study for the test. Mm -hmm. And once you pass that test, you move on and you kind of forget about everything else. But if you also happen to love the material and more of it stuck. Oh, absolutely. But, now you still absolutely. need to, you still need to study maybe to get that A, right? Right. But, but the, the, these, these are the people where they are satisfied once they've really locked it in and they've gone through their note cards and they got it all right three times in a row, you know, at 8, 5 a.m. the day of the test or the <laughs> night before. But the thing is, they're satisfied. Whereas if someone who crammed their ass off for that test who doesn't love this stuff, they're going to be relieved. Like, oh, my God, it's over. I get to take this test and forget this. And they might yep. not say that literally, but that just might be the trickle down effect of of what happens in the wash, rinse and repeat of this boom and bust cram and forget um, system we have. And I, I'm not poo-pooing our educational system either. I, I do, but not for that reason. <laughs> um, but, but we're getting union cards and I've met, I've met more people who truly impress me cognitively with their awareness of the world and their aware, their self-awareness of their place in it, who don't have graduate degrees than have graduate degrees. Right. And of right. course, the person with three entomology degrees knows more about entomology than probably 990 out of a thousand randomly selected people without these degrees, right? Of course. But you're usually knowing the basics. Um, and you know a lot, a lot, a lot of the basics. But if, if you asked any remotely difficult questions, you might impress a bunch of people at an outreach event or a state park where you're sitting at a booth or when you go speak on career day and someone asks a science question. But if I'm in the room and I hear your answer, you, I would probably say, no, that's not right. <laughs> you know, that's right enough for, for this, but for, that's, for, that's for where we are. Maybe, you know. but that's not correct. Right. It's like when you know something in your field and you're watching a movie that deals with something in your field, and you're like, that's not right, but whatever. It's the Dwayne Johnson movie. And I love this. And he, you know, he's got sweaty <laughs> biceps and he's going to blow shit up. And this so is awesome. Okay. And I don't care. And I yep. just don't care. Yep. It's just like him jumping 25 feet without a running start. I don't care. It's what's awesome. So no, but, no, but, he works out a lot. So it's okay. But most people though, <laughs> Most people by default, especially if it's a loved one, but we want to think highly of our loved ones, right? Uh, but people, oh, he has, he, he does this for a living. He knows this. Well, yeah, he knows it more than everyone else in the room who doesn't do this for a living. But again, it's a union card. He could be the worst person in the world at describing new species of insects, but he's just good enough to be able to do it. <laughs> Yeah, no. And I, so, you know, again, I, I had a boring degree in economics, but my, I remember one of my bosses, you know, a long time ago, literally told me, Hey, this piece of paper really doesn't mean anything. It just means that you could start something and finish it. And that's all we're really taking it for, to be honest. It's you just know? my prerequisite, right? Yeah, like be, exactly. don't, don't be impressed with me. Cause I got these degrees, you know, I'll go yep. on dates. I'm perpetually single. So I'll go on a date. You tell someone what you do. Oh, you went to school for that? Like, oh, yeah. You know, where'd you go to school? I got two degrees here and one degree here. Oh, so you're really smart. And it's like, well, getting a lot of degrees doesn't mean you're smart. And I don't even necessarily think that the majority of smart people, IQ wise or whatever, gravitate towards graduate degrees. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's quite a mishmash. There's a lot of indecision that leads to graduate degrees. Uh, you get health insurance and you know basic health care and a free gym membership. And potentially in the natural sciences, a stipend and a tuition waiver, right? So, I mean, I, you know, I got a very competitive fellowship, but I still only got like $8,000 more a year than someone who got a very uncompetitive uh, research assistantship to do their own research. 
Yeah. So and, you get- and, and clearly some people want to do it and some people are just kind of indecisive, like you said, and some people, you know, are maybe afraid of what's out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so again, as I went, as I went along and I learned these things, right. And that's just me learning about life, I suppose, in the world. I, I really became disenfranchised with entomology, the state of NSF, friends of mine going and teaching high school. And even if it was a, a close friend of mine who I, I did not think much of as an entomology graduate student, but they're still my friend that I know they're smart and they just weren't trying. They, this just wasn't their bag. Yeah. They just finished it because they started it. Yeah. Um, but but then I see what they're doing. And it's it, it's just like, this is a rat race. Then I see the impressive people and what they're not getting. Uh, you know, the people who seem like they're the best of the best in your department, right? Um, but you see what some of them get these, these, these jobs and some don't. But then you realize that a professorship in your specialty of entomology, right? Insect taxonomy. I won't get hired as an insect physiologist. I won't. Period. The end. I won't even get an interview. Uh, I won't get hired as an insect ecologist. I won't even get an interview. I am an insect systematist, phylogeneticist, taxonomist. Some people would say these things largely overlap. Some people wouldn't. But either way, th- that's my thing. Uh, you don't hire a child psychiatrist into the head of neurosurgery, right? You don't right. have your GP do a heart transplant on your mother, right? And there's the reality check. Um, you don't have a psychiatrist replace your knee, right? These are obvious things, right? Um, so, and you don't have your orthopedic surgeon interpret your brain scans when you may or may not have a malignant tumor. So they, 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 they took a class. They, they've had the basics. They've gone through the residency. They've had the rotations, but they just know enough to be dangerous in front of people who don't know their field. So again, I see what's happening. And I, you know, I reached a point where I spent most of my life, by the way, uh, very removed from the larger portion of my family that I got along with better. My parents were divorced when I was very young. I was with my mother. Her family was a nightmare. Uh, my father <laughs> was in Florida while I was in New Jersey. His family's great, um, in my opinion. They think they're dysfunctional. And I'm like, You're, no, you guys are glorious compared to this other side. So, but I, I, I didn't get to know my dad really very well until I finished high school uh, in Florida. And so, the, I, I, you know, I, I became very close with my dad. I got to see his siblings, my aunts and uncles more, my close cousins from their generation's kids. And I didn't want to even be successful as an entomologist because to be successful, I don't get to say I'm going to go be an insect taxonomy professor at USF. There aren't any. There's no entomology at USF. There might be some elective. There, there, there are no entomology professors at USF. I wanted to be in the Tampa area where they were. I wanted to be at St. Pete. St. Pete College, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a junior college with a lot of four-year degrees. Okay. You know, so like I, I'm not going to go be an insect taxonomist within a two-hour drive of them unless it's in Gainesville where UF is, right, which is two and a half hours away. I wanted to be there. And even then that's a pot shot because you're waiting for someone to die or retire yep. for an insect taxonomist position to come up. Cause you got to look at that almost like head of neurology at a hospital, head of cardiology, head of the uh, head, head of whatever it is, uh, the ICU and trauma surgery, head of something. Um, it's like the head of when, if you're the insect ecologist, you're the insect geneticist, you're the insect taxonomist. So there's like one, or two at some schools, someone's got to die or retire. And there's no it, turnover. Right. So you're looking at, you know, if there's one of them, a 20 to 40 year turnover. Yep. Yep. <laughs> right. And, and then, and then it's a rat race to get it, you know, because the guy in North Dakota probably wants to move to Florida instead. Um, so it's just so hard. So I, I got my dad's friend to give me a job in there in her brokerage house and I got a Florida 215 and a Series 6 and a Series 66. And uh, we weren't going to do a 7 because of liability. And I was helping with estate planning and selling insurance and annuities just so I could be around family. And then, then her business went belly up. And I went and my dad had a lot of friends in wine and I was really into wine. I, I I sold wine. I did wine showcases. I helped a couple of wine reps. I helped a wine distributor friend. I had like four 10 hour a week jobs working in wine. 
for a year. And then when I real and then and this is around the real estate crash, by the way. Okay. Uh, 2007 to 2009. And it's like, okay, shit, I can't get a full-time job doing this stuff. Estate planning is, is bunk, right? You either are steady. You don't want to go with someone new or someone young when, when the market is, is doing shitty. Yep. You got some young guy, bright eyed, bushy tailed, you know, <laughs> no gray hair is well, I had some gray hair, but you know what I mean? It's like, that, that's not the person you want. You want the person who is handling your best friend or your tennis partner's account for the last 20 years. And they're going to speak accolades about them and how easy it is to get them on the phone. So it was a bad time for that wine. Not a good time for fine wine around the real estate Probably crash in Florida. Not. Probably uh, not. Especially even if you were wealthy, if you were wealthy on a fixed income retired in St. Petersburg, you weren't buying as much Camus Cabernet out of Napa. Uh, you just weren't. So <laughs> it's just the reality. So, so that didn't work. And I realized, okay, I need health insurance. I need a paycheck. I need something with benefits. And my dad was helping me financially a bit uh, consistently. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to get a PhD. And, and then I did. And I got a I got a good competitive position, even though I was out of the game for a couple of years. I got a good fellowship. They let me do what I wanted to do. Uh, they followed through on their promise and they pretty much left me alone. Uh, but they liked me because I showed up at six and I left at six and I was there on Saturdays. Nice. Granted two hours a day of that was at the gym, but, but they saw that I was the first one there and the last one to leave. And they liked that. And I, I was productive. And I, th I think I published more in four years than the other three people in my lab combined. Wow. Um, not that you necessarily expect a lot uh, per year out of a grad student, um, but I was, you know, I was, I was putting in the time. I was grinding. Was it mostly because you actually enjoyed it or was it because I, oh, yeah, you I was were being it. competitive? Absolutely. I loved it. Um, loved, loved, loved it. Um, every time I went on a collecting trip for a week or two, I, I, I would I would write a paper just based on shit that I found domestically, like camping in West Virginia. And I found like, uh, and I was with a friend who was an aquatic beetle specialist. We both like longhorn beetles, um, which include the Asian longhorn beetle to try and name one that someone might know listening to this podcast, big, big uh, invasive pest. A lot of USDA money goes to that. What, what is it called? The Asian longhorn beetle. It's a Asian big honking longhorn. thing. It's like two, okay. two, two inches long. It's black with white polka dots. It, it's, it's a pretty snazzy thing. It's got big spines uh, right behind its head. It doesn't look spiky though until you, you look closely, just on its just on on that section of its thorax behind its head. But it, it's a major vicious pest, and um, so but I, we both were interested in that group just on a hobby basis. But we're very talented. He's an aquatics beetle guy, and we just caught an aquatic beetle uh, that he knew right because this is his thing. He's studied them for like twenty or thirty years. He's about fifteen years older than me. And we also caught some longhorn beetles and it actually wasn't like three random little discoveries. It was a neat thing where all of these species were very Northern species. And we had to the tune of two to 400 miles, the southernmost records for each of these three species, these two longhorn beetles and this one aquatic beetle, this, this, this predaceous diving beetle. Right. And so that was just our, our paper was, that was like the theme of it. Um, so it's not just, again, three disjunct, weird little beetle records that weren't known from these states or something. It's a very minor paper, by the way. This is very soft, like easygoing science, but it's the kind of thing that natural historians just love to do. And the real challenge behind the paper is the ability to identify the species. We have 1,200 longhorn beetle species uh, in the United States, for example. And at the time, uh, there was one book with very little text about any of the species uh, it, uh, to identify the southeastern species. But we're in West Virginia. And so now you got to question using that book, right? Like, is this going to include what we're catching? And this is a more right. northern thing. So, so we're not using that. So again, you got to have the skill set to be able to play this game. Um, and and you this, don't just this walk. also sounds a little bit like what you were talking about earlier about the discovery aspect of, of what you Right, doing. right. And we love doing that, right? And yeah. so like and he and I, same guy, uh, my buddy Eric, as it turns out, he's at the University of Kentucky still. Um, and we went on a trip to Alabama, uh, uh, Moorhead National Forest, uh, last year for a week. 
And we found a whole bunch of state records of things. And they were all these little things, mostly, mostly things that are just like two to four millimeters, no color pattern, these little nondescript, hairy, black or brown color patternless beetles. And which it's grown into a slightly bigger paper. And we started to look at stuff from our, some of our other trips to build on it. But again, yeah, so we like looking at things that most people don't look at when you have a when you have a porch light and you have all these bugs there you stop and you look and you see there's hundreds of little bugs but most people don't stop and look at the little ones they just acknowledge oh look at all those bugs period the end and then they'll start pointing at things that are very discreet and recognizable to them like a june beetle or whatever they think is a june beetle right or essentially <laughs> something that's a centimeter long or bigger yeah. Or a green lace swing because it looks like this nuclear greenish yellow, or a big crane fly with its long gangly legs. It has like you know a, a, a two three inch diameter of its leg span, even though the thing doesn't weigh anything. Um, it's like a daddy long legs fly, basically. Huh. So so you see these things and you're you're registering the big things, but all those itty bitty things they could be things that aren't even known from the state that you're in or even a neighboring state because. There are too many in there's there's 37 or 3,800 beetle species in Florida, and most of them are probably under four millimeters. Wow. For, for context, right? Right. Uh, That's just one state. Right. And so, like, I've got, I, I went to Paraguay for a few weeks. I, 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 I'm working on like eight different papers. I have two of them published already. This was two years, a year and a half ago, just because just I, I look, because I look at these things. And, you know, it's, it's right there in front of me. Anyone who went and collected bugs there had these things in front of them. But most people just pluck the big rhinoceros beetles, right? Yeah. Or the big showy moths or the, and all this other stuff goes unnoticed. And that's kind of the old hat reason that I'm not into butterflies. <laughs> and I'm not saying I know what they are, by the way, right? But right. I don't I don't care enough to deal with it. But if you give me a photograph of a butterfly and you give me... 15 minutes on a website called bug guide i'm gonna figure out what it is <laughs> yeah no so part of the reason that i was asking earlier about you know the decision to actually study this and, and do this for a living is too often especially in these unfortunate and crazy economic times too often i hear people say hey well had people gotten better degrees you know don't go and get a college degree in you know, social studies or arts, or in this case, insects, right? We know that those degrees don't pay that much. So why study it? So I'm curious as to what is the benefit of such, uh, such a field, right? Because I'm not one of those where, hey, if you don't study finance, you're screwed. No, I think you should study what you enjoy. And everything has its place and everything has its value, right? So in the in, in studying insects, what what value do you bring? Like why do, why should people care about these little tiny bugs? Oh gosh, there are a lot of ways to answer that, but usually I need to know something else they care about um, mm. because there are a lot of people for whom I couldn't necessarily give them a good argument that they would relate to. To be clear, right, right, right. Um, about why. This is important. And there are plenty of people, uh, you know, um, plenty of pro environment people who would say like, you don't need to kill these insects. We don't even need insect collections. You don't need more specimens of these. Just take a picture of it. But they don't understand that you need to dissect even some of these uh, some June beetles, right? That we think we all understand at our, our screen door in the summer. Yeah. Uh, most June beetles, until you really have formed an expertise by virtue of thousands of dissections, you need to dissect them. And you need a male, the male genitalia. It's very lock and key. Um, so the, the form of it. It's the same in primates, by the way. Fantastic penis shapes in primates. I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, insects uh, in, in many groups, the taxonomy comes down. The practical, the user-friendly taxonomy is, in fact, performing a dissection averting its penis and pulling away the the interstitial tissues to get to the sclerotized thing because it's sclerotized like a bone like a skull and you use that 
but I, there, there are species in my backyard that I've identified dozens of times to the tune of hundreds of specimens. And only a couple of these species that fall in that category do I recognize on sight under a microscope, might I add. I recognize them by sight under a microscope. And when I compare right. them to other things in my insect tours in my collection. So as far as what, what, what your lay person would consider expertise in these June beetles that could occur in my backyard, I have that expertise. And I'm still saying we can't do it. We need the specimens. And the other thing is that if there's a hundred specimens on your back, on your back porch screen door, who's to say that two of them aren't the uncommon thing that is feeding on something that only is in your neighbor's yard, two doors down in your whole neighborhood. Whereas all the other ones feed on 89 plants and they're all over the place. And therein lies the argument of, well, why did you have to catch and kill a hundred of them? Because to realize that the interesting one was there, that's what it took. To realize it was one species for all 100 specimens, or two specimens of one and 98 of another, or one specimen each of 100 species, that's what it took. And so every time they show up on my back door, if I want to know the seasonality of them, and if some of these are major pests, these are root feeders, these are turf pests, these are not, not all of them, most of them aren't, but some of them are. Well, if you want to understand their phenology, their adult flight behavior when they're out in seasons, well, you're going to kill hundreds of them every night at multiple sites for seasons for years just to get an idea. I, I mean, I mean, to get an idea. Right. And, I mean, you and, need a and, sample. You and, need a large sample, a consistent large sample. Right. But some people would say you got a hundred specimens last night. You have the sample, right? So there's context too. Right. Even though we're not performing a statistical analysis, we still need the large numbers for other reasons. We, we, when we start driving a car, almost every time you break, you're going to make your parents nervous, right? It's a little choppy. Yep. At some point you got fluent at that. How many times do you think? You had to break that car or think about braking before you truly became fluent. And it was smooth almost all the time, unless you were startled by something. Was it, was it thousands of times? I've been in the car with, with a teenage cousin of mine who was driving for two years, driving herself to school every day. And it was still, in my opinion, a choppy ride. <laughs> and I'm not saying she was a bad driver. That's right, not right. the point no, of this. But, right, it's just right. that when, when I compare it to the way I drive or my dad, or my mom, or just like almost anyone who's just been driving a long time. It's like, you know, it, it took so, people don't realize how long it takes to find fluency or what I will call a true understanding of something. And then they don't realize that even with that fluency, in the case of dissecting insects, these small insects, these things we need to look at under a microscope, I come back from Paraguay or I come back from Ocala National Forest in Florida. I put out these black lights with buckets and alcohol in them and I'll, I'll, I will end up killing, I'll put out like three of these traps and each one has, you know, like uh, half a pint of alcohol in it. I will kill thousands of insects in each of these traps a night and I'll go through them. I'll keep a fraction of them, but that's what it took to get them. Just cause you go out there and you throw up a sheet and a light doesn't mean you get it. You got to put out multiple sheets and lights Right. Um, and insects, eye facets are so small. People don't realize this too. This is a, a honey. I shrunk the kids moment. I don't know. Is that a movie? You know, did you grow up with that movie? I did grow up with that. Movie. Okay. Remember when they are shrunk and they're riding around on that ant. I don't remember the name they gave it. Right. Um, but they're riding around on the ant um, and they see their parents at the back door or they see Rick Moranis at the back door and they're trying to yell at him. They wouldn't see him. Their eye facet is so small. They literally couldn't see him. He would have been such a blur. There wouldn't have even been something that was mistakable as a humanoid shape. Huh. They, at, at their size, smaller than a carpenter ant, mind you, they, with eyes much smaller than a carpenter ants as well. Right. They, they probably couldn't see anything with remote acuity more than a few inches away from them. And so even when you imagine something like a bright light in the middle of the dark, when you put that into context of the limitations of the size of an eye facet versus how far you can see, this is why, you know, you got an owl that's, you know, 12 inches tall. 
its eyeball is like your, the size of your eyeball. You get a great horned owl that's like 24, 36 inches tall as an adult, male and female. They have eyeballs bigger than yours. You get a 30 pound, 40 pound eagle. It's again, it's eyeballs almost the size of yours. They occupy a huge portion of their skull. And that's, that's how they're spotting these field mice at, at large distances. And their pupils are bigger. That's really the facet in question, not the eyeball, but the pupil. But their eye is more pupil, even proportionally. So these insects don't even see these lights unless they happen to be superficially, if you will, near them. Now, you know, a two inch long Asian longhorn beetle has an eye that's about three and a half, four millimeters high it can probably see this glowing light, you know, this glowing, you know, purple black light in, in, in the night. Um, especially if there's, if, uh, if it's overcast and it's the opposite of a full moon, there's almost nothing there. They're probably going to see this from 300, 400 feet away. Um, but it's also refracting on dust in the air. Right. And so they're just all these, all these weird little factors that no one would, it's like going to a Neil deGrasse Tyson talk, right? I, there are all these things and I'm just giving you the basics, right. by the way, like the, we're not getting into the real minutia of these problems of why we need all these specimens, why I need to go to Paraguay and literally come back with a hundred to 500,000 dead insects to produce these papers that are based on, I don't know, a few hundred of them. Um, and, and often, you know, it's a hundred of this species, uh, one specimen of each of 20 species, two specimens of each of like 10 or 20 species, five specimens each of a handful of species. And a lot of times, again, you, you don't know what you're looking at until you're home at a microscope, you've spent time combing through the literature you've curated, you've pinned these things, you've had to label them for archiving purposes as well, whether they were useful or not, because you're not even there yet. You got to line these things up next to each other so you can look at them in context and try and infer if something looks different. You dissect a few of them. Then you look at the ones you've dissected. They're all the same. Or they, they might be two species. Can I tell the difference between them? Now I'll look at the ones that I didn't dissect. Can I tell the difference? Gosh, I'm still not sure. Let's dissect more. Let's get more specimens. There are so many species that have been described that a perfectly capable scarab beetle expert cannot identify by virtue of how old the literature was when they described the species. Right. This is, everyone thinks all this stuff has been modernized. Like there is like there are guidebooks to identify the click beetles of South America. There's nothing, man. I mean, there are a couple, there might be a treatise to this genus um, in the whole new world, but it was also written in 1964. There are some hand drawings. There are no photos. Right, they had way fewer right. specimens at the time. They didn't know all the countries that things occur in because they didn't have email to contact curators at different museums at the time. So all these uh, it's, it, it, there's, I guess my, my, you know, I keep saying all these things and a lot of people will talk about their jobs. Like they're trying to tell you how hard it is to make <laughs> them sound important. Whereas in this case, I'm telling you how hard it is for me. I'm right. not saying it's so hard, but I do it all the time. I'm saying that there, like you are just beaten over the head with humility. So if you're looking to feel smart by solving shit all the time, don't be an insect taxonomist. Absolutely not. Oh no. Mm -mm. We, we, we don't even know if we've described 90% of the species on the planet or 5% of the species on the planet. And that's a real statement. There are papers published with estimates of these just for insects, just for insects where people posit that there's only five to 10% of the remaining insect fauna to be described. And how would you know that? Right. Right. <laughs> um, but they, they come up with ways that sound convincing in the context of their argument, but it's like debate class. It, it, yeah. You've been assigned a pro just because you won the argument doesn't mean you were right. And then other people are saying, oh, no, a, a tenth to a fiftieth of them we've described. And, and, they, and they, make, they both make good points. And their points are per completely mutually exclusive for one another. There's nowhere on the Venn diagram that these things would even touch. They're, these concepts that they're using, these metrics that they're that they're I won't say fabricating, but they're but they're conjuring almost from the the, the ectoplasmic magic of science. It's it, it, we are so fledgling in our understanding of the whole of life 
on this planet, um, even though we know a tremendous amount and so much more than two generations before us, even if it's by sheer virtue of the available of information in the internet, right? People who would spend a year of 60 hour weeks of their master's degree in a library can get all their literature in a 60 hour week now for their whole master's degree, maybe less, depending on what you're studying, <laughs> you might be looking at a few man hours and I'm not even kidding. Right. Uh, it, it, probably not in my field, um, but it, it exists. My field is very library science centric. It is very, it's almost like Nick Cage in National Treasure or Harrison Ford or in Indiana Jones, but with respect to finding literature um, <laughs> or finding the specimens that someone was referring to in a paper because it's not always so clear cut. They weren't taking photographs. Which specimen was, was he referring to when he described the species? You need to know this stuff inside, not just to be able to fathom a possibility of that. So, so let me ask this, is there today already something built or is anybody building like a universal library for this in terms of, hey, this is the go-to place. So something that I've actually done in my childhood or when I was younger is I would be outside, I'd be playing, doing whatever. And then I find a bug, right? And it's one of these bugs that you were talking about. It's like brown, small, random as shit. I have no idea what I'm looking at. How do I know that anybody has even discovered this thing, right? So the amount of man hours to answer your question um, are more than you'd think, even though we have the internet. Um, But you would need to start by having access to a microscope and macro photography equipment and stacking software. And I'm not kidding. Like, I mean, we're talking a one, two millimeter beetle. You can't take take the best photograph you can of a two millimeter beetle. And then I'll show you photographs that people are doing on a cursory, like hobby science level that they're throwing on, on bug guide, which is for United States and Canada insects. And even then, sometimes these pictures aren't sufficient. Again, dissections come into play. Sometimes you need to see the underside. Sometimes you need to see the inside of the front femur. And if there's a groove in it to receive the tibia or not, and that will literally tell species one from species two, or genus one from genus two, or group of genera one from group of genera two. So it it's more like if you find something that's an inch long and has a color pattern in the United States or Canada, Bug Guide is probably going to get you an answer. You might not find the answer, but you submit it to Bug Guide, and, right. and specialists sometimes get bored. Or sometimes people who get bored and look at it will see something that they know I know. They're like, oh, John knows longhorn beetles. I'm going to email him a link to this submission. I'll be like, oh, that's that. And then they'll, someone who manages the page will sort it to that. But then, you, then whoever submitted it will get a little ping email, right? And they'll, be, and they'll see that it was identified as a certain species. And now it's over there sorted in that species with all the other images of that species. And all the other data, by the way, that has to do with those submissions, all the dates that it was collected, all the different states in which it was collected, the different months and states, if you will, you can see uh, visually. Um, But but for you to identify it, though, if you if you did not uh, create an account, have macro photography equipment or if it's an inch long beetle, you know, good iPhone nowadays is good enough. Right. With a color pattern. But. For you to identify it, I I think that a lot of people could easily come to an answer that they are certain is correct. And they won't even be close. And other times they're right because it's a ubiquitous, super common thing. And the law of large numbers dictated they would have guessed right anyway. Right. There are a whole lot of species of of these things. uh, And it makes it or there, there aren't many species that look like this. So and it's and it's ubiquitous thing like a like a 10 spotted ladybug. Um, so, okay, easy. But then sometimes, again, there, there are so many species that look superficially similar um, that it's easy when you don't know what you're looking for. It's easy to be convinced that you know. And, and then there's the opposite. Do you ever know any twins, any identical twins? Uh, very rarely, but... So, 
I used right to, now. I used to, uh, so I was a kid. I, I taught martial arts after school as a part-time job in high school. And there were twins and they were Julian and Landon. Boy, Julian and Landon, if you somehow stumble across this podcast, John Levengood <laughs> from Kim's Karate, teaching your class. But um, <laughs> Cherry Hill, New Jersey, that was fun. But so I, so I taught them, right? I was around them all the time. Arguably, their personalities aren't identical, but I'm dealing with, you know, like 20 people in a class, various ages, whatever. I, I taught these kids for a year. I could not tell them apart. It literally was guessing. What, and I'm looking at them all the time right? Not just them. They're in a class of 20, but, you know, teachers come to recognize their students, their names. They remember things about them, right? And they have eight different classrooms of kids a day. And they often figure this out, what, within a month of school? If that, they know all their students by name, by face, easily. Right. I can't figure out these kids. One day the mother tells me, she says, Julian has a slightly higher pitched voice and Landon has a little mole at the corner of his left lip. And once someone told me the difference, it was easy all the time. But if I stared at those kids day in and day out, I could not tell the damn difference. And this is a very, very oversimplified way of trying to convey distinguishing the species identity of an organism. You can have 20 species of something in front of you, but if you didn't know that you had to count the spines on their middle tibia, which you had to flip the beetle over to see anyway, and specifically the middle tibia, and maybe that's the way that you tell all the species apart, or maybe that's how you tell this one species. But if I didn't tell you that, you'd stare at them all day. you're You're not gonna figure it out probably. And there's variation within these things too, right? I've got to tell you the thing that isn't intraspecifically variable. You might find differences that are because of intraspecific variation. Take humans, right. skin color, size, purport, body proportions, sex, if you will, uh, all these things, right? Um, bodybuilders versus ectomorphs. Uh, <laughs> these things come oh, into play. Dog right. breeds, dog breeds, even dogs within a breed. Yep. If you're an alien and you came to Earth, you might think that five different purebred pit bulls were five totally different species because one was white with a black spot on its eye. The other was kind of freckled in color. The other was all black. Another was all right. You know what I mean? Another had chocolate spots on it. And if you haven't seen other dogs and you don't have context, you're not starting to build a comprehensive framework. You think that you're on point, that these are five very different things. Yep. A male white person, a female black person, uh, you know, again, morphologically, there are a lot of differences going on here, even if we eliminate color altogether, um, just with sexes. So this stuff is hard. And, uh, you know, goddamn Star Trek. I love Star Trek, by the way, with their tricorder that they could just wave over something and know it's genetic code and know exactly what the organism was anywhere in the in in the in the universe. Their tricorder. Um, So I swear to God, in the as soon as we could do DNA barcoding, people were like, gosh, in 10 years, we're going to have the tricorder. Guess what? It's been 30 years. We are no closer to that. Uh, We aren't even having that conversation. That isn't even like maybe in my grandkids' lifetime. And the other thing is that then you'd need the genetics of all organisms on the planet. And hold on. Let's talk about all the, the humbling things that I've told you about our inability to identify these things on the planet. And we don't even know if we've, even if we identified all the living species on the planet, we don't know if we've identified one fiftieth of them and described them to science. One fiftieth or ninety percent. Yeah, that that that's wild, right? The, it's so, to a certain extent, unknown. Right, and, and, and genetics creates its own problems too. These different organisms actually uh, that evolved at different times have different evolutionary mutation rates. So the level of variation 
within a species for a targeted gene that you're looking at can have a range of this percentage in species X that's a parasitic wasp, and then a, a range that's one-tenth that variation genetically in species Y that's, I don't know, something like a goldfish. I don't know species of goldfish. I'm not an ichthyologist. So, <laughs> um, but either way, but so, but but then you would use the variation to know how many species there are and whether or not you're, you know, it's one species or another, or this genus or the other. But now the variation is creating all the all this this flex confusion. This creates tremendous problems in genomics and uh, phylogenetics and phylogenomics for our genetic sorting to create these these trees, these cladograms. Um, these evolutionary trees that you see sometimes in published papers. You would have seen them in anthropology or biology when we learned about Lucy and Homo habilis. It would look like a, like a bunch of little forks that lead to an organism at the end, almost like a family tree. Right. And But, but now, the, the, like the genetics, we're nowhere. We think that we've got all these genomes, and as a result, we understand something. Getting all the genomes, that's not getting variation within a species, even. So it's like, right. this is, this is like people think that we're figuring it out and that like something like a tricorder is around the corner when really we've just learned to not try and jam the square through the circular shaped hole with the other chimps. Which makes like, that that's kind of what I was getting at, right? Is, and you kind of uh, beat it over a head with a sledgehammer. Kind of. I mean, so you would think that with modern technology and like you said, that website for North America, right? The United States, Canada, mm -hmm. you know, an expert, let's say someone like you can dissect a beetle, just a random beetle and say, oh, I think this is it. You go on that website, you confirm. You're like, OK, yeah, it is what it is. You know, cool. But there's nothing else for Europe or Asia or something because, that for, so the, you, for the Europe, whole world. Europe has the oldest entomological history uh, on the planet, as it turns out. Uh, taxonomic studies uh, started in, in, in Europe and in Sweden, in fact, with, uh, well, really it started with like Greek philosophers, but we didn't have binomial nomenclature with like a genus and a species and kingdom phylum order and all, all that shit that we learn in bio one. Um, so, but it was really uh, in the, in the 1700s, uh, Carl von Linné, who later got Latinized for some reason in history. Now we call him Linnaeus. We might have heard that <laughs> name in biology class. Now they call him Carolus Linnaeus. His name was Carl, like a German terrorist and diehard, <laughs> like K-A-R-L. His name was Carl von Linné. That sounds like, you know, he could have been a diehard bad guy. Uh, he was a botanist, but he was really into all life, and he started naming things, and he created this genus and species system, and it also meant there were only two words for a full species name, the genus plus specific, the generic and specific epithets, right? And that's why Musca domestica, domestica housefly, homo sapien, human, right? So mm -hmm. he gave it order, uh, and, and that quickly got followed by everyone, and we've still been using it. So that was that, that's pretty spiffy. Uh, I don't find any flaws in it. Like there are um, uh, no big ones anyway, no, no big systemic ideological flaws. Uh, sometimes people just do something a certain way and it works and we just keep doing it, I suppose. But so he was doing that. And, and but it, Europe obviously has an older history uh, for science than North America for obvious reasons. Right. So they have the older history. They know their fauna better than we know our fauna. Um, as a result, there are more books I'm not going to say total because we have so many more people here, um, but there are more books that are treatises, monographs, guidebooks, if you will, to this group of organisms of Europe that are complete than there are in the U.S. There is a book to the hoverflies, which are these beautiful uh, wasp and bee mimicking flies, by the way. A lot of times if you saw them, you probably assumed they were little bees or big bees uh, or, or wasps, but right. they're flies. Okay. They don't sting. They have one pair of wings, not two. Very different organisms. But hoverflies of the UK, I think there's a hoverflies of Scotland. I think there's a hoverflies of Western Europe. We have a hoverflies of the Northeast. Here's the thing. In the US, 
where did we colonize first? Where were our first major cities? All in the Northeast. In the Northeast. Our first entomologist was, in fact, in 1825, uh, Thomas Say in the Philadelphia Academy of National Sciences. I think I'm remembering that right. I'm an entomologist, not an entomological historian. It might have been him or it was C.V. Riley or C.V. Riley was like, I don't know, the first state entomologist or something. But, but so basically early 1800s, we had our first real entomologist working as an entomologist. And again, in Europe, you go back another 75 years, well, you had someone creating binomial nomenclature. You go back another 2,000 years, well, not two, you go back more than 2,000 years, you have Plato, who was naming organisms, but he gave them sometimes a five-word name, sometimes a two-word name, sometimes a 68-word name. It it wasn't a good system. (laughs) There was no organization to his system. What did Plato do? They were just names. Um, And he described things, arguably, but more like a philosopher would group things. Um, So so again, so in Europe, it's a little easier. The other reason it's slightly easier in Europe is because Europe's average latitude is more northern. And the closer you get to the poles, the colder it gets and the less biodiversity you have. So not only do they have an older history of taxonomy, they all, much older, they also have fewer insects per unit landmass because most of most of their portion of the continent is more northern latitudinally. So it's just another factor. Which makes probably sense. Probably wouldn't think of right away, right? It's but it's almost like, well, obviously Greenland has fewer insects than the rest of Europe per unit landmass. Um so so they have more, but they still don't get to say like Hey, I have a this fa- a click beetle. I don't I don't know for a fact whether or not there's a click beetles of Europe or a click beetles of Poland or a click beetles of the UK, right? Right or, or whatever. There might be some for various countries, but I don't think there there are click beetle books out there. There are books for stink bugs of a lot of Europe, but there are significant agricultural pests. There are books for longhorn beetles significant forestry pests and a very hobbyist friendly group. They're very colorful, metallic, etc. cetera. Uh, there are a lot of books, books for scarab beetles, for hoverflies, for butterflies. It's uh, for ground beetles and tiger beetles. If you were to look these things up and Google them, they include a lot of colorful, metallic, hobbyist friendly, collector friendly taxonomic groups. Um, mantises are going to be very well known. So the more, the more, friendly to the public a group of organisms is the disproportionately more comprehensive our knowledge will be of them by virtue of their accessibility in books which makes sense no and and part of the reason that i was asking this is because let's you know pretend that you know you are in west virginia and you are collecting bugs and you are looking at all these things and then you know instead of maybe finding one that just is so different, right? Like, hey, you know, I've never seen anything like this. And you look into your North American uh, bug guide and, and, and nobody seems to know it. How do you know you found a new species or maybe something that got transferred here from Australia? No, no joke. Being like the expert in that group of insects. Like it, 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 sometimes it takes that. Sometimes it's being... It's like being the person in North America that you'd call if you had a question about this group of insects. If you could call only one person and, you know, like the most tenured person in the field working on click beetles or whatever it is. It's like that's the person who's who, who might be able to answer that question over the course of years. So or there is no or immediately. I, I mean, I'm, he might know immediately. Right, right. right. Um, but like but if, there is no guide that says, hey, these are the known insects in this continent or in this region of the world. It's all very separate and just, I guess, no, no. Like, so, so I work on a very colorful group of beetles, but, they're, but, but a lot of them are still small and very variable. Um, and because they're small and they're too small to stick a pin in, uh, they're, not as, they're not as interesting to hobbyists. Um, so I work on checkered beetles. And in fact, my master's thesis, which anyone could find online, is the checkered beetles of Florida. Now in Florida, there are, at the time, 42, I think, species of checkered beetles. I think since then we have added 
two. Um, one species, which again, some people aren't fully convinced. Uh, people would have just said were a color, uh, like a, like a species that just, like a Dalmatian without its spots, if you will. Like um, someone said, like this is a different species. So now there's another species because someone described that species, and someone did that with another critter as well. Um, so either way, we went from 42 to 44. Um, arguably, you would need my thesis, a PDF of my thesis, and the two papers describing these two new species to confidently and readily identify any checkered beetle that you found in Florida. And if it didn't match, you would assume that it was introduced from some, now it doesn't mean from another country, right? It just means from outside of Florida. Right. It could be that this was in the Northern portion of Florida. And this is something that is historically a Southeastern thing. And we just didn't have specimens of it when I did my study. And maybe it's always been here. Maybe the specimen was collected a hundred years ago, but it was sitting in a museum and it was never identified and, or it never, I was never aware of that specimen. So it wasn't in my thesis. So things like that can happen too. Um, but again, then you got bug guide too, where you can try and figure things out. But for, so if you get a checkered beetle in Florida, uh, my thesis and, or these two other papers, or will possibly complement it with these two other papers are, are going to answer your questions if you have a basic fundamental understanding of insect taxonomy, in most cases, you can use pictures of the critters to tell them apart, but not in all of them. So, so again, like if you found it, I couldn't tell you that even if it's in my thesis, that you will be able to identify it. But if a beetle taxonomist from China was on vacation here and he knows beetle morphology, right? Um, and, and he catches a checkered beetle in Florida, regardless of where it falls and color pattern expression of maybe a tricky species, he can probably infer what it is successfully with my thesis. Gotcha. Very, very probably. And that's if it's a, it, and we're only talking about the most tricky species you could catch. And one of the most weird aberrant color forms, like, like, again, like say an all white Dalmatian, right? Right. In the text, you're going to read a Dalmatian has spots. And it might say, oh, on very rare occasions, it doesn't have spots. But you don't assume that you have the rare occasion. You're just like, well, mine doesn't have spots. What other dogs don't have spots when you're going through this? So, yep. so you get like, so from from a non-specialist, and I don't even mean non-entomologist. I don't even mean non-insect taxonomist. I mean a non-beetle taxonomist. To deal with this isn't so easy. I think most most insect taxonomists though would probably do fine with my thesis. Um, that's not meant to be a statement of the quality, good or bad of my thesis. It's just, just that good. But, but again, it's, it's just, it, it, it's like psychiatry to neurology to orthopedics. You know, it, right, it's, right, you right. really need to think of, of so many sciences like that. You don't say my dad's an engineer. So he understands whatever this electrical engineering problem is. Well, I don't know. Is he an engineer that creates new car engines for General Motors, maybe he doesn't know anything about electrical engineering or computer engineer or, you know, whatever. Um, no, yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, they might understand, you know, a very similar language, but there's right. no specialty, right? right? We, there's no we, specialty we, we, in the other thing. We have the core education, <laughs> Yep. right? We, we know who to call. Right, right. right. But, but, but it's, it's, it's like that. I, but then again, you know, just to, uh, to give a, a good everyday example, I mean, you go to the doctors because you don't feel well. Your doctor isn't telling you what you're sick with most of the time. They say, yeah, you have a cold. It's either a rhino or a bronchovirus. Well, guess what? A rhino and a bronchovirus are as distantly related as a beetle is to a wasp. Mm. They, they are not similar things. Right. They just both happen to be viruses. They are not even in the same class of viruses, let alone whatever any, anyone would fathom as a genus. So you have a rhinovirus or a bronchovirus. They're basically saying you don't have the flu, and I'm pretty sure you don't have an infection, and it's not staph because I gave you that uncomfortable swab in the back of your throat, right? And nowadays, uh, up your nose for covid so we'll we'll rule out a few very specific things. Then I'm going to tell you it's one of these two classes of viruses, and I can't even tell you it's specifically 
one virus in this class or the other virus in the other class. They don't know. And then often they're going to give you a broad spectrum antibiotic just in case you're starting to get an infection because they don't know. Yeah. And that's modern medicine. Now, yeah. I, I, again, I'm not poo-pooing modern medicine. It's just that this is where we are. While we can say in a very short period of time, because we put so many man hours of science into it, uh, well, we tested COVID. It's not COVID. We did a staph test. It's not staph. I can tell by your symptoms it's not the flu. And I can tell by your x-ray and by your by, by uh, you know listening to your heart and listening to your cough that it's not pneumonia. I can tell you that it is not this list of, spe- and actually pneumonia is a few things, but it is not this specific list of things. But after that, it may or may not be one of these two classes of virus and you may or may not have an infection. So here are some antibiotics. That's where we are with medicine, which has had orders of magnitude, perhaps to the tunes of thousands or even tens of thousands, more man hours of science dedicated to it than entomology. That's where we are. And people don't realize how fledgling our knowledge is of of, of so many things, uh, sports science, even the basics of sports science were nowhere. Um, and I'm not saying that from a perspective of humility. It's just that when you really start talking to these people about what we know versus what people think they know when they read a men's health article that kind of right. out of context references some study, you know, it, we, we don't, this is, um, boy, I don't want to get on a COVID platform um, at all, uh, but that's it, not, anything I ever enjoyed doing, but uh, there, regardless of what side of the COVID argument you're on for vaccines, right? I don't care which side of the argument you're on. Okay. Um, uh, People have their reasons. And as we come up with new studies and we change our parameters or advisements to the public for safety, it doesn't matter which side you're on you will question things or say, see, now it's this. So we, we were right all along or, oh no, see, now they're changing this. They don't have any idea what they're doing. Or, you know, people come up with narratives to these new studies. Whereas really, regardless of what side you're on, what's happening is it's not that the scientists, if we're talking to the scientists and not the people marketing the science on right, the news right, or whatever, right? right? But if we're talking to the scientists, it's not that our previous science was wrong. It's that as we do more and more studies, those studies all get viewed in hindsight together. And that field of science has just become smarter. And so now that we have more information in that realm of studies of this question we're trying to solve, science three months ago couldn't form as good of a conclusion as it could today because today we have more studies. So on before we said you can't go out in public and wear masks, and now a few days ago, depending on when this this is being released, it's mid-May right now, but a few days ago, or what, two days ago, yesterday, uh, we got the announcement that now if you're in public, and you're vac- fully vaccinated, uh, you don't have to wear a max- mask with uh, certain exceptions, right? Right. That doesn't mean that science was wrong before when it said you couldn't. It meant that was our safe, pragmatic decision given the science we had at hand at the time. And so as science got smarter, it was able to give you a more informed decision over time. But people instead, based on the side of a very emotional, in many cases, argument or stance that they take, people want to weaponize or give agency to changes in these developments. When really, it's like, hey, uh, before we pulled a bingo number and it was a B, right? It was B1. And now Mm -hmm. someone says, well, they're all Bs. Well, at the time, they were all Bs. You pull another one and it's B5. See, they're all Bs. Later we pull a G and someone says, oh gosh, they didn't know what they were doing. They said it was all Bs. Well, they didn't say it was all Bs. We just had all Bs. And this is where the interpretation of science versus what science is actually saying really has a big disconnect to the public. It is wonderful that we make science available to the public. 
it is perhaps people's rights to right. know what this science is saying. But, and I mean this very seriously, unless you actively do science, and I'm sorry if you're listening, if you have a science degree, period, the end, I do not fancy you a scientist. If you have three science degrees in a particular field, I do not fancy you a scientist. I think that if you are actively doing science and you are actively having to comb through scientific papers and finding fluency in what is known in your field and what makes a good study a good study and a bad study a bad study just by sheer virtue of the data set they have and recognizing that methodologically before you even see what they're saying and their conclusions or their results, right? So it's not even about their conclusions or results. Until you have the ability to ferret out and troubleshoot these things, Maybe you're not the kind of person who should be interpreting any of this science. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't mean you have a right to have an opinion about science. I'm just saying that more often than not, it's much more complicated than, than people realize. And they don't know the history that goes into something. You see someone snap at his or her spouse, and it seems very inappropriate. And the spouse just takes it in stride and you're at a dinner party and you don't know them. And most people are reacting like nothing happened. And you think it's because it's awkward and they're afraid to say something. So you feel like you need to say something. And then it turns out that, I don't know, the, the husband has Tourette's and everyone knows it and he doesn't mean it. And everyone knows he doesn't mean it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but you didn't know that. And, and this is a weird example to give, but sometimes it's about that blatantly simple. You didn't know something that is obvious and, 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 and broadly understood to people who are Im immersed in this field. Yeah, and I mean, and, and this is a very valid point and something that I've talked about multiple times on the podcast of the vaccines come out and everyone becomes a doctor. Like literally everyone that I know, including myself, I'm guilty of it started to kind of go through and read news articles and, okay, well, this vaccine has this uh, success rate and this other vaccine has this success rate. And, you know, I read one article that this one is not so good for this other, you know, type of people or females struggle with this one or males, whatever. And it's like, wait a minute, we're all idiots. Like we know nothing of science in, in that degree, right? All we can interpret is what the final statement of that article was. And all well, of a sudden, well, people start to, people feel like they're doctors, right? And, they're, and they feel emboldened to just go on social media and say, hey, don't do this. Don't take this virus or um, this vaccine or this vaccine is better than that vaccine. And it's like, okay, in reality, we know nothing. All we know is that these vaccines were created by scientists who are probably 20 times more intelligent in that field than anybody around me. So why would I trust the guy that I used to know in high school posting these things as opposed to, <laughs> sure. you know, a scientist who actually has dedicated his life to working on this vaccine? Right. But you already, though, gave uh, an example that would find so much forgiveness in me in someone's judgment. You heard something and then you looked to find more opinions on the same something. Mm -hmm. A lot of people hear something and run react away. to it. And that just became their opinion on it. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then these articles that you are finding potentially, unless you are literally pulling up the actual journal article, you're reading an article written by someone who probably has a science degree or three. But as I said before, I don't fancy you a scientist. And a lot of people right. with three science degrees aren't good at interpreting papers in their own field. Because if you don't do a lot of science, you don't understand the snags in science. You don't understand how a data set can tell you something so smoothly and soundly and obviously and convincingly, but you don't know how to recognize the fault in a data set. Even think of a statistics class when you think of your sample size. Yep. Some people don't think about sample size. Yep. Right. Some people don't think about, oh, wait, the sample size is all elderly people. Um, what does that change about whatever they're telling me in this study? Yep. Uh, the study is, was in Europe, in this country, at this time frame, at that time frame, 
they had a stunningly low infection rate at the time or a stunningly high infection rate at the time. Was the study done in India last week and they're in a horrible place? Or was it in India early in COVID where India just hadn't been hit yet and it seemed like they were doing everything right? There's, there's so many things that people, and even when people read scientific papers, they tend to skip the methods. The methods are the meat and potatoes letting you know how closely you should pay attention to yep. what's in the results and the conclusion. But then you have someone writing an article for the wallstreetjournal.com, whatever, they have a biochemistry degree and then a master's <laughs> or a PhD in neuroscience. Guess what? They're not a biochemist or a neuroscientist because they're writing articles for wallstreetjournal.com and probably making between 20 and 30 grand a year. That they're not, and I'm not, there's some scientists I know, by the way, with three degrees who love what they do, who only make 30 grand a year working as collections managers in natural history museums, right? Comes up, but but it's so it's not the money, it's it's just that they're they're people often with part-time hourly jobs. Right that were hired because they happen to have science degrees because that will lend credibility. They will misinterpret an article. They might not even give you the important points of the article. Yep. And now you are going to react to what might be out of context points in the article. <laughs> um, you know, and in otherwise, but these people might be good writers. Being a good writer and happening to have a degree is probably what got them the job. Yep, yep. Being a persuasive writer, coming up with titles that will get people to click them. Like good hooks to make people actually, A, click on it and maybe even read it, right? Because a lot of people don't read it. (laughs) And that's the job, right? Right, right. So I'm not damning the people writing them or the job. They're doing their best, maybe, or they're not. But again, it's like a union card. You, you might not care about what you're doing. You might just be hustling out articles. More articles get you more money, possibly. Uh, so th- this is this is really tough. I saw someone very recently post an article about GBS. Uh, I can't remember. It's like a Guillain um, Bourjon or something syndrome. But GBS, there was an article that came out recently. And it was linking GBS to COVID. And they posted, I can't believe what's happening in the country right now, blah, blah, blah. They showed the title of this article about GBS being associated with COVID. And then they posted this other article that came out the same day. And like the news, not, it's not like it's from a journal, just that we're going to start giving COVID vaccines to 12 to 15 year olds. And the person's reaction is, are you guys insane? So I read the article. The article was that an elderly woman, a single 82-year-old elderly woman with a history of respiratory problems, GBS is a respiratory link problem. I think it's also an immunological uh, disease. I don't remember the particulars, but this 82-year-old woman uh, got a COVID vaccine and then afterwards had GBS and she died. Um, They had no way of even attempting to say that the COVID vaccine caused it. They said the COVID vaccine does in fact induce various things that have uh, respiratory illnesses, right? It can exaggerate or exacerbate or induce the expression of these various disorders. It's not creating them necessarily from scratch, by the way, but it does create some respiratory problems, but it seems to be more prevalent in people who already were uh, predisposed to a respiratory problem. Um, I'm not a doctor, a medical doctor anyway. I'm a bug doctor. So. <laughs> but 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 so so that's what it was. Um, and and even in the end, they said that um, this is this, this can cause this, and this is the first case of GBS that has been associated with COVID. Now here's the catch: How was it associated with COVID? I'm not denying that it happened right after within two weeks of her COVID vaccine. It's associated with COVID because this scientific author associated with COVID. And if I stub my toe two weeks after I got COVID and we said that COVID can induce the COVID vaccine can induce symptoms that create drowsiness. And that drowsiness made me not notice a, a doorstop and I stub my toe. Is that a COVID associated toe stubbing? Yeah. Now, now I'm giving an exaggerated analogy on purpose, 
I'm not, but the thing is, is that these people happen to see someone come down with something after they happened to get a COVID vaccine. And yes, COVID vaccines very readily induce respiratory problems. But this is a woman who probably was genetically predisposed to GBS her whole life. And for the last three decades had her cells pecking away at her for this to eventually happen. Very probably, maybe not by the time she would have died naturally. And yeah, it might, it might've brought it up early. And but in this paper, they didn't even say that this caused it. They never once even used the word cause in this, in this context. Person just read the article. This is associated with this woman died. Now we're yeah. giving vaccines to a small child. So again, I don't care if you're on the pro or anti-vaccine. What I commented to this person who was a friend of mine was you can have 89 reasons to not want to get the COVID vaccine, but I pray to you, don't let this be one of them. This is bad science in any field. Yeah, it's very easy, especially in today's world, to kind of, you know, I don't want to say it's all bullshit, but to create bullshit, right? And and I actually heard an NPR article not too long ago where there is a place where medical people insert um, side effects of the vaccine and everything else. And literally, when you go in there, you will see stuff like, oh, this person tripped over a tree branch and they had their vaccine like a week before. So that was part of a side effect, right? They tripped on a branch that they might have not tripped on had they not gotten the vaccine. So it's not even an exaggeration, right? This is actually happening. And people are using these things that they read and they find and they can do whatever to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go and, you know, use these unofficial Facebook posts to make a decision. Right. And it's and I, scary. I linked to them the actual article, which was publicly available, which is unusual for a new medical article, depending on the journal. But um, it's just interesting. You know, it's like if that article even had five people all across the world in the last, I don't know, few months where this happened. I just say, OK, I mean, absolutely. If you are predisposed to a respiratory problem. Right a COVID vaccine can provide an unnecessarily dangerous risk. Um, and, but we knew that already. Right. And, and one of my buddies, he's a nurse, right. And, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, when everything's trying to get, you know, in, under control, I remember a lot of people saying, Oh, well, it only affects people that are unhealthy, right. Or people that have an underlying condition, but him as a nurse, he was seeing a lot of younger people that looked healthy go in there and have to be on a respiratory or whatever. And it's kind of what you had alluded to earlier is that maybe they did have a condition, but nobody right. knew. Maybe nobody all knew. of them had a condition, right? Maybe all of them had a condition. How do we establish that? Right. And then look and, and then look at the a doctor diagnoses you with a cold analogy and just realize where we are with and even even in hindsight trying to figure this shit out. Yeah. I mean, we, we're, we have genetic markers for some very specific things that we're checking for constantly. Yes, you're, 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 the prenatal state of this embryo is going to have autism or Down syndrome, right? But we look for that all the time. We, we did a lot of work just on that. It's not like we were working on genetics and these are our findings. We were working on those specific things. So we don't, have these specific skill sets, just like we don't have the hoverflies of Florida book, right? <laughs> we don't have these things. We just aren't there yet. But people want to assume that it's there. In, in science in general, um, people want to assume it's not because people want to be right, I don't think. I, I, I don't know what... I. But when people hear something, it sounds convincing to them. They just they just swallow it. It sounded convincing at the time, and now it just became a fact to them. Yeah, and I think um, regardless of the field, right? Regardless of the field of science, I, I think a lot of that in my from my experience, because I've I mean I have friends all over the spectrum, but it's does it fit a narrative that you support? 
Because if it does, then yeah, you're automatically going to take that as a fact and run with it. Um, and if it's something that actually contradicts your idea, then you're probably more likely to either A, just shut it down and say, no, that's not true. Or B, look for reasons to say that that's not true. And that's a kind of scary, sad or situation. Alternative hypothesis. Right. Alternative hypothesis. The absolutely less that you know about a field, the more likely you are to inherently trust a fact, in air quotes, that you hear pertaining to the field. Right. It's... um. But, but like you said, if, if you want to have agency, if you have skin in the game, if you are afraid of COVID or if you think COVID is a hoax, whatever, I don't, again, I don't care what side you're on. Yeah. Um, but regardless of what side you're on, most of the people with the side have no educational background in the knowledges that would go into founding these arguments. Right. So, so when you hear something, you, you want it to be right. And you want to believe that we understand this. But like I said earlier about science, we just keep learning more. It doesn't mean science was wrong. It it's means ever that, evolving. And, right, it should, we just, and it should. We just focused that microscope a little harder and we could see something we couldn't see before. And, and people don't like that. Uh, if, if you don't work in a field that has that inherently that you expect this plasticity and in important interpretations, it's probably very jarring. <laughs> I can only imagine what it was like growing up in the AIDS epidemic in, in the early eighties, for example, as we're learning about it at the time. Uh, that must've been terrifying. Every time you heard something a little different, you're like, well, what the hell do I do now? Right. No, it's, um, it's almost like I feel I feel like we're lucky to go through this today, but at the same time, unfortunate. I don't know. It, it is what it is, right? And you just kind of have to make the best judgment on everything, right? Not just not just the vaccine or, or COVID or whatever, but literally any topic you pick. I mean, people out there who know nothing are pretending to be experts and voicing their opinions and, and you just got to navigate through that. Well, and, and here's a, a innocuous horror about people in the sciences, the scientists, the, the people who fancy themselves scientists who I might not call a scientist, right? Um, some people, again, they think they're a scientist. I'm not trying to make, I'm, this is not a nice <laughs> way of putting it. I don't mean to be insensitive. Uh, but if someone fancies themselves knowledgeable of a science, but they don't actively conduct the science, the, the, the more you learn about something, generally, the more humble you will be in it. Right. If you work in this regularly, you're going to find greater humility for it. If you are a high school physics teacher, you know way more about physics than me but you're teaching the same things every year. You have a tremendous amount of, uh, of experience and respect and knowledge and nuance to the things that you're teaching. And you've found new and creative ways to tell people about them and find new examples about them, but you're not doing other things in physics. Well, unless it's, unless it's a vocationally, right? Unless it's by, by hobby reading, personal interest outside right. of the high school physics curriculum, right? But by virtue of your job, you're you're doing essentially very similar things um, every year with the same classes again and again. You might get better and better and better at understanding it, but you aren't continuously trying to push the limits. When I studied checkered beetles in Florida, I finished. I moved on to new projects. I still have that knowledge base. It's not obviously not as fresh. Right? right. But I keep doing whole new projects. It's like I went from teaching physics to teaching chemistry. I'm not saying that I think entomology is as complicated as multiple different fields of science, by the way. <laughs> right. But but I taught this particular physics class and then I taught this particular chemistry class and then this this different chemistry class. Right. But th that's not what it is over time. They aren't teaching 20 different courses over 20 years or 60 or 80 courses over 20 years. 
but I'm trying to publish four to six papers a year. And once you've published something that's known, it is no longer new science. You only publish new science. So I'm continuing, no matter how well I know checkered beetles, every time I publish something that is no longer on the shelf for me to reach for my next project. Right. I need to continue finding things that I didn't know yet and that people didn't know yet. Right. And, and this is where, this is where I, I, I make the statement of, of doing science um, actively for your job. And it, I, 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 boy, I, I'm not trying to, but I feel like I'm coming off as an asshole to no, I mean, a lot of people with science degrees, but it it's, makes sense because like if, if you're practically static in, in such a field as science, you're not really discovering anything new. You're, you're teaching, you're teaching and you're, and you might be an expert at that. You, one you've mastered field. that realm. Right. Exactly. But you're no longer discovering. Well, and you're also operating in the realm of theory. These are the theory of gravity. We will literally test gravity today. It is a known theory. The theory of this, uh, whatever, electrical resistance thing in physics. We're operating on things that we know to be true. Let me, um, before I let you go, I do want to ask you about one thing. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I believe it was uh, an older episode that I did. Um, I want to say his name is Rich Snow. I think that's his last name. Um, he had brought up two instances where he had made a theory. You know, he does he, basically of two insects of basically countries using them as weapons. Um, now, I did a little bit of research and I saw that, you know, through a random Wikipedia article, who knows if this is true, or accurate, whatever, but uh, that Japan had used bugs in, during World War II against China to kind of spread disease and, and kind of attack um, mainland China. But the instance that I was wondering if you knew anything about is more hit close to home. And the two examples that he used was in 1940, the Japanese beetle was sent over here to kind of just destroy our, you know, environment, crops, whatever. And then the other thing was the, which is actually currently happening, I believe, the spotted lantern fly, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that that one is only attacking older, weaker trees, which mainly are used in crops, right? So they're older, they're more vulnerable, but younger trees, they don't really get destroyed or killed by these bugs. So he was saying, you know, maybe these things were introduced here uh, by China to kind of just fuck with our trees that, you know, we use for producing fruits and vegetables or whatever. Do you know anything about that? Like, does that sound even remotely true, possible? I'll, I, I, uh, to remain as neutral as possible, I have never, I've never heard any of these things posited uh, by an entomologist or at an entomological conference or in anything I've ever read. Um, so there's that. <laughs> uh, number two, um, let, let's say uh, I believe him. And I don't, and it has nothing to do with me thinking that he made it up, by the way. It has to do with the logistics of introducing a species to the United States. Um, introducing a species to the United States and having it be successful um, is, or to introducing it to anywhere, um, if you will, uh, is very hard. We arguably have... Uh, reproducibly feasible numbers of things make it in on shipments that weren't necessarily uh, inspected well enough. Every day, multiple times over um, in the history of world trade in America. Well, mass world trade, let's call it the last hundred years since the banana Republic era, if you will. So all the time, all the time, 
uh, reproducible, reproducibly feasible numbers of things are being introduced to the United States. They are not taking hold. Right. Um, they are things where we don't not. Yeah. They're coming from my, a lot of them will come from the tropics. That doesn't mean they won't survive more often than not. It's not the, the fact that we have winter because these things are usually coming to ports in Texas and Florida and even if it's coming to New Orleans or Alabama, it's coming to Mobile, Alabama and Gulfport, Mississippi, the seaports, right? Right. Um, so they are in the most mild areas. And even if it gets cold there, like they could be spreading, a hurricane could come and displace them radically, uh, by the way, <laughs> to a lot of other places that are more tropically friendly. So we, we, are, we are constantly bombarded, just peppered. Uh, with the potential for new species introductions. And often the same species over and over and over again, constantly. I, I can't express that enough. Right. And I don't mean that our, our, our international vetting and inspection services are failing, but you also can't inspect everything. You know what I mean? This is, we're playing a law of large numbers. We're trying to get the, the heavily infested things. We're, we're going to fumigate, right? Right. And this is what I do, by the way. I make these decisions. I don't do the inspections, but I make these uh, these regulatory decisions based on the insects found in these international inspections, these on these international commodities. These are things that, that, that in, in Florida, by the way, I'm doing this. We don't have all of these invasive species of these things that I'm seeing all the time that invariably have made it in a hundred times over or, or more. <laughs> Or more, I, I can't right. express this enough. So there are things about soil salinity, soil acidity, alkaline disposition, uh, phosphorus requirements for development, degree day requirements for their development, average rainfall, moisture potential, different bacteria for which they don't have a resistance during their pupil phase. All these things are the factors. So to say, we're gonna give you the Japanese beetle, and have it take hold, that's kind of like saying, I know this is the scratch-off ticket that wins me the supercharged Dodge Ram. <laughs> to say we're going to give them the lantern fly and it's going to succeed, even if you drop a thousand, it doesn't matter the numbers at this point. We're going to give them the, the spotted lantern fly and it's going to take hold. I, I don't I, I don't know how to put it. That's like that's like when Charlie bought the chocolate bar and he's like, I'll bet this one has the golden ticket to go to Wonka's factory. Right. It's, 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 it's so improbable and it has nothing to do with the number of introductions or the number of specimens in question or the timing of the introduction or any of these things. We literally get flu shots regionally. We get, we get multiple different flu shots in the United States because if you get the wrong flu shot for the wrong regional flu that you're expected to get, it's not going to work or it won't work as well. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so if you get the flu shot and then you go to Europe, well, or Asia or something, you might not be so resistant to the flu. But now just imagine strain. you're in the soil. Your body is immersed in the soil. You're a larva. You're under bark where there are slime molds because the larvae of these um, spotted lantern flies will take, take harborage under under bark or under loose issues of wood uh, so predators aside there's slime molds there's fungi there are these spores that they might not have the appropriate defenses to bacteria nematodes that could be their parasitoids that people say oh well they, we don't have their parasitoids here that's why these invasive species explode well sure if we but sometimes there are parasitoids that attack a whole bunch of different things we could have a parasitoid here that attacks a whole bunch of different things, which for some reason favors the newly introduced thing. Right. We, we have right. backfires of introductions of beneficial insects in this way that we never predicted. So again, to, to say, ah, they meant to deliver these two species. The only credibility I find in that is if they actually meant to introduce 5,000 different species. And these were the two that worked. Right, right. Right. And maybe they did. Right. Maybe they did. But this is, th this is why I don't find these things. Um, 
uh, practical arguments uh, or practical hypotheses, if you will. Um, yeah, especially if you say that it's attacking a specific tree, right? Because then how can you, how can anyone be like, all right, you know what, we're going to introduce these 5,000 bugs and all, and we're going to design it to target, you know, large crop trees. Right? Well, arguably, but, but, well, well, the argument there, though, let's just say that you you meant to introduce it, and we assume that the introduction will work. Well, there there are a lot of very similar tree species in in northern China, temperate China, as there are in temperate U.S. And a lot of times, these the like bark. There are certain bark beetles that will attract different pines and different elms and different oaks, hardwoods and softwoods, different families of trees, let alone different gene, genera and species. So they're not so specific all the time. So that that's, some of these things have a real big shotgun of things they can use as food, food items and hosts. Uh, so just like Japanese beetle, that'll feed on a lot of different things. Um, it's pretty versatile. So, so, so those things are more likely to exceed at being invasive species because they don't have very specific requirements, right? Your generalists are going to be more likely to succeed. Um, we have the kudzu bug now. That's kind of new, well, in human history in the United States. But we had kudzu for a much longer time. So we already had its preferred food plant here as an invasive species in the southeast. So when the kudzu bug accidentally came over, it had a, you know, it's like it already had um, uh, free condos as a perk for relocating. <laughs> <laughs> and sure, there could be predators, this, that, and the other, but they're, they're immatures actually. And I'll say the same thing for the spotted lanternfly. They don't have a larva. They have a nymph and the, and the nymph is very mobile. And it's not as soft bodied or as delicate as a caterpillar or a grub or a maggot. Um, so they're a little more durable and they are more able to remove themselves from a displeasing environment if they can perceive it. So, you know, if you're that and you're polyphagous, you'll eat a whole lot of different things that will serve very much in the favor of your survival. And again, Japanese beetle doesn't require a particular host plant. It'll feed on a lot of things. That's really going to help it out. Uh, the other thing I'll say, though, is that Florida has about 100 families of beetles. I think it's 104 families of beetles. Scarab and dung beetles are a family. Click beetles are a family, just for context. Okay. We've got like 36, 37, 3,800 species of beetles that we've recorded that we know about in Florida. There's probably several hundred more. Uh, right. Lots of little stuff. In one particular family... One particularly invasive family for some reason, right? For its behavioral proclivities that my master's advisor worked on. We have about 40 native species and about 40 invasive species. And now that now there is a huge number. This goes, this is like the exact opposite of all the arguments I was just giving against assuming that you could introduce something. But then again, this these things are invasive, but when did it happen? Was this happening? These are not host specific things. Uh, these are temperate friendly things as well. They are, they're predators. They feed on a lot of different things. And so maybe that's why, again, they're more likely to succeed just like a Japanese beetle, which isn't a predator, right? Or the spotted lantern fly, but they're polyphagous. And so we have these beetles, so many of them. It, it, I think it's the highest proportion of a family that's invasive of any family in Florida of beetles, specifically beetles. They're sylvanid beetles, which includes the sawtooth grain beetle, which is a, a worldwide cosmopolitan um, stored product pest because of every, all the way back to the pilgrims or, or, or China colonizing Japan, you know, like it, it right. goes way back. So these things have, it, there are certain groups, right, of organisms that are really good at it. And apparently sylvanid beetles are incredibly good, right? with respect to their total diversity at being invasive. Um, but chafers uh, or like things that include the Japanese beetle, we don't have many invasives of them. We might have like two and the Japanese beetle is one of them. I'm not giving exact numbers, but it's a super small number. Right. Um, longhorn beetles. We have quite a few, but longhorn beetles are protected inside the wood of the trees in which they exist a lot of these trees literally exist here because they were brought from the old world. 
even if they're now ubiquitous. So they came along with their pathogens or their nematodes or whatever. So they're, they, they might already be evolved to deal with a lot of these problems. Not that there aren't other plant pathogens that'll get introduced, but so this is like, I guess what I'm saying, well, just like all the things we've discussed today, the, the, the art of in introducing a species deliberately as an act of aggression, if you will, there's so much to it. And, we, and like I've said about everything else, we don't have the science to understand whether or not it'll work. Right. Um, so they were doing scratch off tickets. It might not be like the lottery where there's one 163 million chance of winning, but it's probably like the scratch off ticket for the supercharged Dodge Ram where there's about a one in 20,000 or 50,000, or maybe it's worse than that chance of winning. But yeah. But, and I think that that's part of the, the part of the conversation that is difficult, right? Because if you want to believe something and you can't rule it out, right? Like, and you can give a million examples, right? You want to believe something, but if, if someone gives you a, a, a glimmer of light and say, Hey, yeah, there, it is actually possible. Now, is it absolutely probable? possible? Yeah. Is it probable? Maybe not. Right. Like, but you know, same thing with the vaccine, right? Hey, you know, you get a vaccine and this person, you know, died from, this thing now all of a sudden it's like ah see may, may, maybe the vaccine is kind of dangerous or or w whatever any other example right um and, and i think that this is part of the problem with the country as a whole is the conversations that we're having so right now you are being a very uh uh what's the what's the word you're, you're, skeptical you're, no you are explaining things in all angles right this is how it could, but this is why it also, it, would, it wouldn't be a direct attack, right? It would be very difficult. So you're, you're, you're covering all angles and they right, all make sense. Do me wrong. If someone charged me with explaining how it could happen, I could probably give you a list of 10 very convincing ways of how the spotter lantern fly could be introduced here successfully. The thing is that these other very broad general things that I said that didn't sound very specific are overwhelmingly more powerful than these other things that I'd list. But if I list these things for you, it's going to sound so convincing. Right. Right. It's going to sound so convincing. Right. Um, because they're specific and specific feels powerful. Uh, but then you look at the large numbers and you look at the history and you look at all the things that we don't know about these organisms because we don't. Most of what we know about the spotted lanternfly in, in, in world science journals all over the world is after it got introduced here because people are studying the shit out of it now. <laughs> right. Right. Japanese beetle, same thing. Oh, it's resistant to these pesticides. We didn't know that before it got here. Nobody did. Nobody did. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's like, it, but so after the fact, it's very easy to, to create an argument. But again, I can give very persuasive arguments about this. And, and my reasons that it's not practical seem like me waving my hands in the air. And that kind of is what I'm doing. But, but, it, but this is the kind of thing where it makes so much sense to me because I've been in this field for like 60 hours a week for 20 years. Yeah. And some people have been in this field for a 20 minute Google search yeah. or five minutes going through their Facebook feed and then clicking an article and reading the first two sentences and then deciding they don't want to read the whole thing. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, it, 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 there's so much to know that we don't know. It, it, what I thought you were going to say, by the way, was using columbola, which are called springtails. If someone wants to Google that. They're these little microscopic, well, not, you're visible, but they're very small wingless insects that are, exist in leaf litter, uh, under bark, uh, in the uh, upper levels of soil, and they're fungus grazers. But I remember learning in my med vet class that there were rumors. So in my textbook, it's just that there were rumors that that the uh, that I, I think it was China or something in warfare was airdropping columbola as if they like reared them in mass, like millions of these little two millimeter things after dusting them with anthrax. 
And there's never been any, well, I, I'm not going to say there's never been. I, it's always been treated as a hand-waving hypothesis. Okay. In my med vet textbook and my professor at the time just kind of giggled at the idea. Right. But he says, yeah, oh, no, it could happen. I suppose that would work. They're very small insects. I don't know how well it would stay on them because these little particulate matter pieces of anthrax, if you, these, the dust that you get on them, but it's a two millimeter critter and they groom it. If you watch a roach or a fly, they groom themselves constantly crickets. It won't take them long to groom themselves off of these, a, a, a dozen or so pieces of dust. Cause it's such a small critter. Right. So Again, so, so, but but then again, I don't know. Is 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 it is constantly dusted? Is there moisture gradient that they're using? Right, I can create arguments. Right, I, I, does, does this stay on them when they're falling through the sky at a very slow rate because they don't have a high terminal velocity because they have such high wind resistance because they have almost no mass to their surface area to volume ratio? You know, like I, I can say, all, I can just come up with all this hand waving stuff in both directions all day. But this was in a Medvet textbook that it was hypo that that's. There is conjecture that the Chinese did this in warfare. <laughs> so it might just yeah. be that that some tactician said it once at a press conference. <laughs> and, and then it made it into textbooks for you know, decades past. But but that, that was the example I heard. I thought you were going to bring that up. That's really where I thought you were going. Um with this, there was once a rumor that the love bug was a University of Florida science experiment trying to cross a horsefly <laughs> and a mosquito, <laughs> which are both much larger insects than a love bug in most cases. Well, a horsefly is tremendously larger. I guess a mosquito is more dainty. And these things are no more closely related to one another than a house cat and a dog. Ridiculous. Like... I've had people ask me this. So, John, is it true that that there was a UF experiment and they did this? It's like, it's like, yeah, just like there was a UF experiment that a pit bull and a tabby had a litter. Just doesn't make sense, does it? So, but that that was something I encountered too. I, I've heard some weird things. <laughs> and yeah, and and look, I I I take information and I take it all with a grain of salt. Um, I can't for very I'm, I'm heavily things. salting my meal today. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, all, all I'm saying is I, I think that these conversations are great. Uh, this is part of the reason that I do the podcast is not just to have the, the, the conversation out loud, but to kind of learn to look at different angles. And I mean, you, you literally lifted every rock, um, with every question that I ask. So I really do appreciate that. Oh, we, I mean, we could probably talk an hour about any of these things and, and I don't oh, even fancy myself knowledgeable about most of this stuff. I, I think I know just enough to be dangerous. I think, I think that I know enough about general methodological flaws and misinterpretation of science and, and public behavioral trends and misinterpretation of science that, that it lets me be a little dangerous. And you know what else that can make me be very convincing if I'm wrong. That's the scary part, right? Right. You've got, so you've got people that may like who may not say what you say, right? They may not acknowledge the fact that they're completely wrong or that they are maybe manipulating. And you know, how do, how do people know? Right. I mean, half the things I say, I, I always want to backpedal. I, I, I keep wanting to say, if I ever, if I offended a science teacher out there, I'm really sorry. It wasn't my goal. I just, it's like, I, I, like, I don't, I don't understand a lot of medical science because I don't do it. <laughs> right. I, I just don't right, do it. Right. I don't know what is or isn't compelling in the context of what they're doing. So uh, this is kind of where I'm coming from when I say these things, but you know, it's like, I'm, I'm just stream of thoughting it. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to misrepresent people. And I, and I, and I, you know, these aren't things that I'd probably say to these people if they were in front of me having the conversation too. Well, you know, it, it's something that I, I, I always say is that everybody has an opinion and it doesn't mean that they're right. doesn't mean that they're wrong. It's an opinion. I can tell you that I hate yellow or I hate red or I hate orange, right? That doesn't mean that I think any less of them or any 
better than them. It's just an opinion that I have created. Everybody has opinions. And I think that everybody should understand what an opinion is. Um, Not a lot of that in the world. No, no. People get married Not to their opinions. Not a lot of that in the world. world. A lot of... Not not to overuse a word like bipolar, but a lot of a lot of diatomic aggression. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, it's either black or it's white, right? And there's right. that's it. And and no, and I appreciate what you what you do, right? You you say, hey, here's fact one, but you know, I'll, there's also back fact two, and also I'm not, you know, I'm not a genius and knows everything. Oh, dude, I, um, I, so I, I dinky little paper I'm doing. It's not prestigious, by the way, in my opinion, to describe species. I think it's kind of easy if you have the expertise to know it's a new species. Right. But describing the species is easy once you know that, right? You're just saying these are its morphological traits, period, the end. It might it might require a lot of terminology, but it's, it's, it's something I'm fluent in. So it's almost like a coroner listing things, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, on on his recording device uh so but um but bef- so i've got this paper where i'm describing a new genus and three new species of checker beetle from from costa rica and i've had these specimens for a decade i just didn't get around to it and i i got a few more specimens in that time but not enough for two who have been worth waiting a decade All right but i will tell you that for the first three years of that decade I had someone who knew about these things for 20 years before I ever started working on checker beetles. And he, he knew this was new, uh, this new genus, new species. And then I found more specimens of other species, right. That were clearly related to this. Someone else found more of something. They knew what it was. They sent it to me. Uh, he's publishing it with me, but, but the thing is that even though someone spent like 20 years knowing this was a new genus and a new species or, or what we estimate to be a new genus, it's very arbitrary, really. I spent the first three years that I had those things trying to convince myself that I shouldn't describe it as a new genus, but instead as new species in an existing genus. Three years of my balking was purely because of that. And the other thing was that because I hadn't seen all the specimens that someone literally held in their hands when they described all the species in this greater group of insects, the subfamily of checker beetles of all these genera, I was wondering if perhaps something that had only been written in the literature, never been imaged, never studied again, no one ever looked at it again, if it had already been described. So it wasn't, it took me a long time just to come to peace with that. Even though I never found any evidence to the contrary, I just wondered, what if we already knew this? And then a bunch of other people will just describe it as new. Um, And then after the fact, someone else will come along and say, dude, you were wrong. This is the same species as this. And they sink sink the species. And it doesn't mean that your paper doesn't exist anymore when you described it. But, you know, you're probably going to lose a little credibility. So I think I was too careful. But this is just one of those things that can happen because you might eventually realize this shouldn't be its own genus. Why am I trying to get that prestige? Or is this a new species or do I just think it's a new species? And and I think I think that as long as it doesn't become combative, a very strong sense of skepticism is a very good survival mechanism to avoid coming at aggressive odds with people. They might be upset that you don't agree with them, but they won't find you an enemy for not disagreeing with them (laughs) right? or for disagreeing with them. But, but this is the thing about science is that skeptics make good scientists period. The end period. The end there's, if you're not a skeptic, you will jump to a conclusion that has already been jumped to somewhere else because you didn't dig hard enough or cover all your bases and make sure that you knew what was already known in this field. And, And there that's the thing. It's just like the people reacting to things. They don't realize how much information is out there, one. And two, they don't realize how little we know right. with all this information. It's it's daunting. And even academically speaking, this world is orders of magnitude bigger than we think that it is. It's like our own universe just right here on our computer. And just like the universe we haven't discovered most of it. Yep. Right. Good, but good. we're but we're trying to make inferences and make sense of it. And and this is where we separate humility from 
I don't know, devout confidence and I don't know, reactivity, I guess. I don't know. I, it's, it's getting late and I'm, I'm starting to babble <laughs> philosophical. Uh, I didn't drink enough bourbon for that to have happened. So, <laughs> well, maybe next time we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. And, uh, and I know that you're like super into movies and dude, I, I would love to have a chit chat with you about some of the movies and stuff like that. So next time we'll, we'll, we'll hit that type of stuff up. But, uh, no, I, I really appreciate you making the time to kind of just sit down and talk about this stuff. It's truly fascinating. Oh sure, yeah. It's 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 fascinating having a having a, a spotlight put on what we don't know. <laughs> hey, I mean, it keep it it should make everyone humble and, and make make them want to have that conversation. I, I hope so. You know, if anyone listened to this and liked it even a, a little bit, and you haven't heard anything quite like this, I'm not saying that I'm some unique special thing, but you just happen to not hear much like this. Boy, if you ever get a chance to go see Neil deGrasse Tyson speak publicly. Uh, go do that because he does so much better for astronomy uh, than I think I do uh, with this. He, <laughs> he will give me chest tingles with how he connects to a public audience of hundreds of people of all backgrounds and just make them all understand things that are pure hokum or things that we thought we knew that we don't. Um, yeah. So I'm not trying to say like, listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast or something instead of uh, this, <laughs> but, hey. but if you get a chance, he, 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 he's about as eye opening of a modern philosopher without trying to be as I feel like I've encountered. No. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of his speeches and I've listened to him on different podcasts and stuff like that. No, he's uh he's a very talented man in articulating and connecting uh, the universe actually. So but I, I do, again, I do appreciate you making the time. I appreciate your honesty, your candor, and um, and your skills, man. I More people need to do what they love and not just chase the money, right? Right, sure. The money would be nice, though, but uh, <laughs> probably not worth the, worth the, uh, the blood pressure. <laughs> it's usually not. It's usually not. All right, well, you have a wonderful night, man. I really appreciate it. Sure, cheers, man.